Good to be with you again this morning. Enjoyed being here Wednesday night and look forward to spending the day with you and I appreciate the invitation. Uh, of course our family as well. Uh, just excited to be with you this day and it's hard sometimes when you're away from home you miss your church family. Uh, I'm sure you probably like that too when you go and visit somewhere else you think about what they're doing this morning and uh, we, we love our area and love our church family in Gulf Shores but it's also good to visit other congregations and see brothers and sisters in Christ and see what God is doing in a different community and in different people and uh, that also encourages us because we begin to think we're not alone no matter where we go we can find somebody with some connection to God and uh, receive some encouragement from it so we've blessed, been blessed to be with you Wednesday and, and really excited about today and uh, today I want to start just basically by building on some of the things we talked about on Wednesday night just for my information how many of you were here Wednesday so I can kinda see okay so a lot of you. Okay, that's great. Uh, last, last time we talked about basically this idea of trying to get to heaven, to realize that uh, we're on this trip, this journey, and we're sojourners. Uh, the Bible calls us foreigners, uh, sojourners, pilgrims, and those are songs we sing. In fact, there's some old songs we used to sing a lot more with those terms in them. Uh, but we're reminded that we don't belong here. This is not our home. Uh, we're just kind of passing through, and I, I made the illustration that uh, it's kind of like in a waiting room. You know, we're in this waiting room of life, and our eternal destination is, of course, heaven. And so we don't, we don't belong. We're just trying to kind of get through. And God has given us his GPS, uh, God's positioning system, the Bible. And so as we begin to read through and see, uh, we get the map right. Today I didn't get lost getting here. Isn't that great? Because I read the GPS exactly the way it was supposed to be. Now Sarah had to comment a couple times, is that right? Is that right? Yes, that's right. Stayed with it. But sometimes if you're not following the right directions, you will end up in the wrong place. And so uh, we talked a little bit about that Wednesday night and dealt with some things that can help us in resolving conflict. And I wanted to do that to help get to where we are this morning. And that is how we can improve communication. Uh, anybody feel like they're just an absolute great communicator? Anybody? Just, I mean, you got perfection? I saw the hand go up. You were... <laughs> so... so we, we all probably could find areas to improve, but I would almost guarantee that most of us could say communication is, is one area we would like to improve on, especially if we've dealt with difficult people. Um, I had somebody come to me one time and she, and she said, would you please do a lesson on how to deal with difficult people? And I said, sure. I said, is, are you using this for me or <laughs> somebody else? Uh, and she said, no, we just, I deal with a lot of difficult people at work. And so I, I incorporated that into one of the lessons that I did because we need to learn uh, how to get along. Uh, and then we have our PowerPoint. This will work here. Yeah, there we go. Our PowerPoint, as Slate does. How do we get from here to there how, as a sojourner, as a pilgrim, knowing that I don't belong, that heaven is my eternal home, how can I get there with my family on board, with other people that I'm supposed to be in charge of on this particular trip? And now as we do that, um, like I said, we talked about conflict resolution last time, so now I want to talk about how we communicate inside the vehicle uh, trying to get to our eternal destination. Polling really helps, and there's a lot of great uh, material online. In fact, most of us probably, if you buy books, you probably buy less now than you did before because you can get a lot of stuff online, either through PDF or you can, actually you can rent it. I don't know if you know this, but if you, if, I'm sure your public library does this. You can go to the public library and uh, go in through the Wi-Fi and you can actually rent or check out uh, most e-books for free from your public library and I do that from time to time so you can get books and materials and I, I really like Barna research there's a lot of good stuff on that so I'm going to use that today as we talk about the family and things we can do to improve communication inside the vehicle trying to get to heaven the first one this morning is time there we go so the first one is time we just don't take time to spend together very much anymore. You know, Ephesians 5.16 says, redeem the time. What does that mean, redeeming the time? What's the word redemption mean? Preserve, Preserve and what? Use okay, use it while you have it. Uh, take advantage of it. Cash in your chips. You know, you use that time while it is provided to you. And that's what Paul talks about. Now, Jesus gives... He's the giver. Satan is the taker. And so a lot of the things we're going to notice this morning are things that Satan has made his way into our lives, and he's trying to remove these things that actually should be a blessing for us. 
and a blessing for other people. We, we get in such a hurry. Uh, we're always in a hurry. On the DailyMail.com, they did a survey back in 2013, and they went through all these families. It was like 100 families. And they did a straight-up poll of how much time the families spent together. Uh, I'm going to let you, I'm gonna let, you, let you guess. On average, how many hours does a, the average family spend together all in one unit in their house? Per day? Yeah. Well, let's go, let's go, um, let's go, yeah, per week. Let's go per week. I'll give you the hour in a minute. Per week. 15 hours? It's less than that. Less than that. Eight hours a week. The average family only spends eight hours a week together in their house when they're not sleeping. Eight hours a week. Uh, the best of those days will be usually either on Saturday or Sunday where they average two hours together. The average during the weekdays is 36 minutes. The average American family, 36 minutes, is all you have with your children and with your wife alone, on average, in America. That's, that's unbelievable to me. 36, 36 minutes. So if you, if you only have 36 minutes, what are you doing with that 36 minutes? Um, it, it's very hard. Yeah, we, we eat, we you know, watch television together, but that's, if that's all the time we have, we need to do something about it. That is a, a major communication killer. Uh, it's very difficult to sit down with someone and communicate to them if you don't have a relationship with them. And I, I submit to you, if we don't spend more than 36 hours a day, we really don't have a relationship with our family. We have a stronger relationship with our coworkers. We have a stronger relationship with those we go to school with. And so that's a communication killer. Um, I had a friend in high school. Uh, she lived next door to me. And uh, when her dad was going through some health issues, she had never spent any time with her father. He was always working, always working, and he started feeling bad. And um, she, he comes into the, to the kitchen to have a conversation with her, and he started having a stroke. And she didn't know, because of his health problems, if that was normal. She didn't even know to call 911. She didn't know what was wrong with him. She just thought he was odd. And she went on to her room. Uh, and finally, he was well enough to get to a, to a phone, but she didn't even call 911 because she didn't know, but maybe this is the way her dad acts all the time because of his health problems. And I thought, how devastating that she, she didn't even know her father well enough to, to help him out in such a difficult time. We need to spend more time with our family. You will spend more time with people uh, that you love, or you should, anyway. If you want to spend time with them, it'll increase your relationship, obviously. When you look at dating, why do these young people always want to be together? Because they, they want to spend time together. They love each other. They want that time. And families need that. Um, another communication killer is entertainment. And that one you probably could guess. There we go. It'll come up. Entertainment. Uh, it, how many of you have a cell phone? How many of you have a tablet? Anybody have more than one cell phone? Some people do. Yeah, business people do. Uh, we have a lady at church. She has three, and her husband has two. And it's very odd. She works for the government. So she's got a government phone, and then she's got a government employees that the people she works with phone, and then she's got her own cell phone. And uh, that's a lot of technology to handle. We, we, most of us probably remember a time when we didn't have those things. I mean, we remember, I remember going to my grandfather's house, and I know I'm, I'm just this close to 40, but I still remember going to my grandfather's house in Gainesville, Missouri, and he had a party line. Anybody know what a party line is? And I would go to use the phone, and there'd be two ladies yakking it up, you know? And I'd say, could I use the phone? Well, we'll be done in a minute, honey. 30 minutes later, I pick up the phone, they're still yakking, okay? Now, they may have hung up and called back, but, and there was a way to get information. You, had, you knew when the phone rang, like, once, that it was... Yeah, you knew once or twice, you knew by the rings which house it was supposed to go to. That's so foreign to us now. We, we, remember, we remember the phones with cords, you know. <laughs> you do? Good for you. Uh, we remember the house lines. I remember one time my grandfather, he's like, everybody needs a computer. Computer's the next big thing. And he went to a garage sale and bought a Tandy big box computer. And, and he was so excited because it had a floppy drive. 
It had a floppy drive. Now you can actually save stuff, and we never could get it to work. Never could get it to work. But that's, that's how technology has changed. Um, my grandfather, my first television, he gave me a black and white TV. And everybody was going to color, you know. But he's like, you got to have a black and white TV. I was like five years old trying to watch cartoons. And that doesn't work on black and white. Very tough. So things have changed. Uh, television has changed. Our music taste has changed. It used to be that country was country. Now country's rock. And rock is heavy metal. It's everything changes. And so we need to be careful what, what entertainment we allow to enter into our home. I'll tell you something else that went the way of the dinosaur is our family time at dinner. You remember when we used to have family time around the table where you all come in and you sit down and you don't grab and go to your room or you don't kind of, it's not the buffet, it's we, we have it all on the table, each of the sides, and we sat down and we eat together. We wondered why our families struggle, it's because we're not together, we don't, we don't have time together. Our entertainment has overtaken us. I asked a kid one time, I said, what, what do you enjoy doing with your father? Because he said he didn't have a relationship with him. I said, what, did you, what do you enjoy doing with your dad? And he said, watching movies. And I said, but you're not conversing. That's not, that's not a relationship. You're just sitting there looking at a screen together and laughing at appropriate times. Uh, that's, not, that, that's really draining our families. Unhealthy communication lives uh, through the television screen. And there, we gotta be careful what we watch. Uh, I know as Christians, as we walk through this world, if people see us watching and listening to all the stuff that they like, uh, they think they're one of, the, you know, we're one of them. And we're not. We're different. We should be those type of people that if something offends us, we say, I'm sorry, I can't do this. I need to, as a Christian, I, it, it offends me. Um, so entertainment is a killer. Another one is fear. Fear should not be your default. If you really truly believe, and this is a toxic thing for Christians, if you really believe that God is in control, what are you afraid of? There are a lot of things that we fear. And I did a, a lesson one time. I went through a hundred different phobias. It was kind of interesting. Very long list of phobias that people face. And I had a lady come up to me afterwards and she said, could I get that list? I'm afraid I missed one. <laughs> I said, you're afraid you missed one of the fears. Uh, but I gave her the list. And I posted it online on our church website so other people could see it. But we have all these things that we're afraid of. Um, we're also afraid of communicating, which is part of the problem. We're afraid if we talk to somebody, they might take it wrong. Or that it might actually lead to further conversation <laughs> that we don't want to have with them. We're afraid of being real. We're afraid of being genuine. I think sometimes we're afraid of sharing our story because we're not sure how somebody else is going to respond to it. When you go through the dating process, and you finally find that, that one that's for you, you have to have some of those awkward conversations to say, here's some things that I've struggled with, here's some things that I've dealt with, here's some things that I'm looking for. And we need to continue to have communication as we grow in a relationship with someone. As we're married, we still have to continue. You know, the number one, commu communication is the number one cause for divorce. It is, because a communication breakdown will lead to sexual problems, It'll lead to financial problems. Uh, I had a, a good friend one time. He, he and his wife were expecting a child, and it was time to buy a new vehicle, and he said, I'll take care of this. And he went to the uh, car lot and came home with a brand new Ford Mustang. And he was so excited about having that Ford Mustang. He said, this is the best vehicle we've ever had. I figured out our money. I think we can make the payments. And she looks at him, and she says, where's the baby seat going to go? And he said, I don't know, but I'm not taking the car back. And she says, where's the baby gonna, where's the baby gonna sit? And they had this fight, they had to come in for counseling. <laughs> they didn't know, he didn't want to get rid of the car and she didn't want to have to put the baby on her lap, you know? And so we gotta have communication and, and fear also along with that is worrying. Jesus says in the gospel, or Matthew, he says, well, you can't add one inch to your height. You, you can't add a day to your life so what are you worrying about? We need to let worrying get out of the vehicle on our way to heaven. We need to trust that God's will will be done and look for opportunities. And also think and meditate on positive things. And uh, specifically in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 8, which was on the previous slide, we're supposed to think on things that are noble, things that are true, things that are just, things that are praiseworthy, he says there at the end of the list. Those are the things we need to focus on. 
Uh, if, you, if you're consist consistently consumed by negative things, you're going to turn into a negative person. If you find that you're really starting to get aggravated easy, there are certain things you need to turn off. And I know at our church family, when we have our men's meetings, I know that one of the things that almost every man in that room is worried about is politics right now. I mean, they're so frustrated. And I keep telling them the best thing you can do is turn off the television. That's the best thing you can do right now because there's nothing you can do to change it. So just trust in the king and we'll worry about the president later, okay? Don't worry about those things. Don't let fear uh, consume you. Nourish your soul, speak from the heart, and let God do the heavy lifting. There's no need for you to do that. There are certain things that we carry we shouldn't, and that's why Jesus says in Matthew 11, why don't you lay your burden down? Just give it to me, and I'll give you mine. It's much lighter. You just carry it. Uh, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. So fear. Another one is maturity. Oh, boy. Anybody here really loved having that conversation with their teenager? You know, the conversation. The birds and the bees. Anybody just love that? I can't wait to have that conversation. It seems a little awkward. You sit down and you say, okay, here's what's going on. And here's how daddy knows or mommy knows that this is going on. Because I've been through this stage before, you know, and the sweat is just dripping off their, you know, they, are, they don't want to have the talk. You don't want to have the talk. But I tell you, if we don't talk to our children about maturity, somebody else will. Somebody else will. They'll get it through media. They'll get it through, uh, you know, other books or their friends. And so we need to be concerned about maturity. Letting our children know that the stages of life are tough, but you can get through it. I think it's interesting that Jesus' story, there's this gap. We have a story of him around two years old in the temple. And then Luke 2 picks up with him what we would consider to be his bar mitzvah year of his, his 12th birthday year, where he's there in the temple. And there's nothing in between. Now, if God has given us the, the roadmap to life, the GPS system, why doesn't he include that part of Jesus' story in the Gospels? Why do you think there's a gap from 2 to 12? Anybody got an idea? What, what if I told you there wasn't really a gap? It says that he did all that his mother told him to do. Now, it's not worded exactly like that. But it says he was subject to his mother. Do what? He had exactly what he needed. And Mary and Joseph were exactly what he needed to get through. He, he listened to his mother. And if you don't believe that, go to John chapter 2, and you'll find he spent 30 years of his life following his mother's instruction. And even on that day... He doesn't even perform his first miracle until his mama says it's okay. Anybody else got a 30-year-old son like that? Jesus' story, what a story. He was subject to his mother, and she taught him all that he needed to know. You, you find if you look at James' words, James' words, Jesus' half-brother, and look at Jesus' words, they share some of the same points and stories, and I'll bet they learned that from their mother. So we need to talk about maturity we also need to tell our children um, they're not going to find all the things that they need in a book. They may take a health class. You know, they may, they may have a book or two that are maybe given to them to understand these stages, but we are, we are what's provided to them to educate them. So we need to help them through those, those stages. And also, we ourselves, as we get older, have to understand those stages of life, of maturity, and tell our kids, eventually it's going to be time where you're going to have to take my keys from me. Eventually, there's going to come a time where I'm not going to be able to take care of myself. And I'm going to need someone to do that. And that's why our children are provided to us in those later years of life, to be there for us and to take care of us. Uh, and that's a hard lesson to learn. A lot of us don't want to give up that. You know, we don't want to give up our, and that's the next one, security. We don't want to give that up. We want to have all that to ourselves. And eventually, our children have to step in and help. Uh, number five. Some of your kids may have not even moved out yet. <laughs> Maybe like Jesus, 30 years old and still at home. But they can help. They can help. Then there's insecurity. Insecurity is another communication killer. Anybody read Par Parenting Isn't for Cowards by James Dobson? I know it's dated. It's older. Uh, we've probably heard of Dare to Discipline and some of his other books. Bringing Up Boys is a great one. But Parenting Isn't for Cowards is one of his best books. And in it, he talks about how fathers 
have to have this confidence. If you watch television shows, even if you watch TV, you see the commercials for places like Hardee's, you know, and you see that they, they, they turn the men into these very odd, uh, strange creatures that they don't even know how to operate, that men don't know, they have no security, they have no confidence, they have no boldness, and they just kind of just get through life. That's not the picture that God has planted for a man in the home in the Bible. The male in the house is supposed to be a leader, a spiritual leader. And so we need to take advantage of those opportunities when we're with our kids to build some security in them that I'm going to be here for you just as God is there for me. I'm going to have your back. I'm going to be here to encourage you, to strengthen you in whatever way possible. With mothers, mothers need conviction. Uh, they need to stand firm. And, and secure parents will raise secure kids. And so we have to have that security there. That if our kids see us weak, if they see us stressed, if they see us worried, and I'm talking about frequently see that. Sometimes there's nothing we can do to, when we're upset or frustrated. But if they see us every day on edge and not sure what I'm, and I'm not, I'm not on a schedule, you know, and I'm procrastinating over here, and, and, and I'm so frustrated, I've got to have my coffee every day, you know, and if I don't have that, I'm not going to do this, and, and, and oh, we're off schedule again. And if, they, if our kids see that, then that's exactly what they're going to become. So we have to be secure, and we have to be strong uh, if we're going to get to heaven together. Uh, give your, room, your kids some room to fly, but also give them room to fall. Let them make their own decisions. And when they make those mistakes, you pick them up. You don't have to be in their face. You know, I told you so, I told you so. And that, that's a strong, a strong feeling, even for me, is you want to look at them and say, I told you so many times. Well, that was not the person you needed to be with, you know. That's not the thing I told you to do, but they are going to fall. And instead, the spiritual giant will go to them and say, well, let's pray about it together. And if, if you want me to give you advice, I will. I'm here to encourage you. That's, that's a strong mother, strong father. Another communication killer, I think, that keeps us uh, maybe distracted and then eventually on the wrong road is Knowledge. We have that tendency to be the know-it-all. You know, I want to I know everything, and I want to tell my child everything that they should do and constantly stand over them. If we do that, they'll never survive on their own. Because as soon as they get away from you, they've got to call back, can I do this? Can I do that? I don't know. And we can't do that. We've got to train them and teach them and give them the knowledge they need to live in the real world. Patience. Patience is very, very important. Training and teaching is very, very important. Parenting shouldn't be a fight. Childhood shouldn't be a conflict to settle. Child rearing shouldn't be a war. Uh, likewise in our marriages. Our marriages should be a place of peace. Our home should be a place of peace. They shouldn't be a place where there's all this conflict going on. Um, I've heard so many times from children, and they don't tell their parents. They tell counselors and mentors, they say, my parents fight all the time. It's like they're always arguing over something. And that breaks my heart to hear that there's these children that are constantly hearing uh, yelling and yelling and yelling. Uh, the story is told of this young, two young kids, little boy and little girl. And mom and dad were in the front room and they heard just this awful screaming and throwing stuff. And they went in there to see what this tantrum was about. And they step into the doorway and little boy and little girl are throwing stuff and screaming at each other. And the, the mom says, what are you guys doing? What are you doing in here? And they said, oh, we're just playing house. Now, if that happens, we've got a problem. <laughs> if that's what they think parenting is in the home, if they think that's what it's all about, then that, there's a disconnect uh, from a spiritual perspective. Uh, we should encourage our children, give them knowledge, and when they fail, when they succeed, help them to understand there's consequences in life. Uh, that's just the way it happens. And, and teach, really encourage your children to learn more. Another one is values. We live, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in the worship hour, we live in a post-Christian society. Now, you may disagree with me, and that's okay. But I believe we live in a post-Christian society. We are in a society now where it's not the norm to be a Christian. It's not the norm. Uh, there are millions of people who do not believe in God, do not believe in heaven, and there are millions more that act like they don't believe in God and act like they don't believe in heaven, that claim to be Christians. And so we're living in this society now where it's so difficult to try to 
be who God wants us to be. We're, we're, we're always being watched. In fact, we're afraid sometimes. I, I, I found sometimes I was nervous coaching my team, soccer, baseball, etc. I, I had this feeling that I wanted to pray with them before games. But I knew that if I did, you know, somebody would say something. Uh, and then you have the choice. Are you going to do it or are you not going to do it? People get offended easily now. That, and political correctness is, is completely out of control. But nothing should change our value system. And that's one of the things that God has given us our children for, is to teach them and train them. Think about the schools they're in, public school. Think about their culture. Think about their school curriculum, their teachers, their peers, the social pressure. And going back to what we talked about earlier, if you only have them 36 minutes a day, then they're getting a lot of negative information, including some horrible values. Uh, I think it's foolish to not know what our children are listening, what they're not listening, what they're listening to, what they're reading. We need to know what are they reading, where are they learning these things. Uh, I heard a little boy one time just say a horrible potty word, and his mom looks at me with her eyes. She goes, "I don't know where he learned that." <laughs> so, well, I bet I could come up with two sources. Mom and dad, where do, the, where do these kids learn these words? Our kids need to learn how to talk, and they need to learn how to act, not from you know, uh, the schools, but from us as parents. And we need to set a good example for them. When our kids start spewing potty words, or if they're, they're, they're saying things and doing things that are ungodly, we need to look at the things that they're involved with. Look at their entertainment. Uh, where are their values? We think that uh, idolatry is also an Old Testament concept. You know, that's, idols are, you know, these little golden things or silver things that people made in the shape of an animal or a person. And that's the idol of the Old Testament. But in the New Testament, idolatry is described as things that have replaced God. Anything that you have allowed to get in between you and your relationship with God, that's an idol. And in, uh, there's a story in Genesis around chapter 35 where Jacob... Apparently, his wife, one of his wives, Rachel, had taken the idols from her dad's house, Laban's house. Do you remember the story? Laban, her dad, had tricked Jacob, and so that to get back at him, Jacob decides to leave basically in the middle of the night. And he takes both of his wives, Leah and Rachel, and all the kids, and he takes off as fast as he can. He's trying to get back to his, his dad like he really left on good terms. He didn't. But he's trying to get out of there as quick as he can. And Laban comes, and he's upset. He clearly says he's upset he didn't get to kiss his, kiss his grandkids goodbye. But he's also visibly angry because the idols are gone from the house. That means that they're, they're going to be sold for money because they're probably of great value. And Rachel, of course, she has them hidden in her tent. She sets down on them. She refuses to get up. And there they are. They're hidden away. They keep those idols after that for quite a bit of time. And by the time we come to chapter 35, Jacob has this special spot he calls Beth-El, that is the house of God. And he says, it's time for us to bury these idols. It's time for us. He buried his, his nurse uh, maid, his, uh, the, the woman who had nursed him there um, at that same time. I think her name was Deborah. And there's a lot of death. His dad's going to die. Uh, his wife, Rachel, is going to die right around those same few chapters. So he's dealing with all this death. And one of the things that he says we've got to do is we've got to get God back into this relationship between all of us. And they have to bury these idols there and start over. And there are certain things even in our own lives we need to get out of the way um, to get our values back on, on the right path. If God is first in my life, then my children are going to see that. My spouse is going to see that. Don't, don't depend on your spouse or your children or your parents to be your spiritual connection to God. That, that's something you need to work on first. <clears throat> uh, along with that, with values, Williams Institute and Pew Research reveal that there are 8 million people in the United States that are either gay, lesbian, or transsexual. 8 million people. 3 million of them will raise a child. Those children We'll go to school with our kids. They'll play on the playground with our kids. They'll be in sporting events with our kids. And we need to prepare our children for what they're going to do in those situations. I remember just a few years ago, I performed weddings on the beach all the time. And I would tell those people that we were doing weddings with, you know, I, I, I will not do a wedding unless there's an Alabama marriage license, because that was my easy way out, because Alabama didn't allow uh, gay marriage. 
but then suddenly things have changed. Can you imagine? And within just the last year, we've seen other things change with bathrooms and things. And, that, and we get to panicking. You know, so what in the world's going on? We need to talk to our children about what's going on in the world and remind them that this is the way the world works. This is the way the world acts. We shouldn't be completely shocked. A church ought to be unshockable and unshakable. We're ready for this stuff. Uh, we've trained our children. We've trained each other. And more importantly, we've learned how to minister to those individuals and try to keep all of us on the track that God has laid out for us. Another one, another communication killer is relationships, and we dealt with that um, on Wednesday. There's a lot of drama in childhood. There's a lot of drama even as you get older. The teenagers, it's a whirlwind for them. They're going through physical changes, emotional changes. They've got dating and driving and all this stuff. And as parents, and yes, as grandparents too, we need to do a great job in counseling and mentoring our children. And that means sometimes having those tough conversations even when they don't want to hear it. My grandfather has been gone for, oh, probably 10 years now. We lived in the same town in uh, my junior high and high school years. And we, I traveled with him just about every summer all over the place in his motor home. But my grandpa, all he wanted to talk about was the Bible. That's all he wanted to talk about. And there were times that we had conversations that whew, right over my head. But I'll tell you, I miss those conversations now. I miss being able to have someone I can go to and talk to about those kinds of things like my grandfather. And we need to have relationships with individuals. And I think I mentioned Wednesday. We need to have people around us that can help keep us accountable, that, that we can have this relationship with, that they can come to us and say, you know, what, what are you struggling with? What can I pray for today? Those things are going to bless both of us in that, in that relationship. To be compassionate, to have good heartfelt discussions. We're often quick to quote, say, Exodus 20 verse 12 about honoring our parents. But it's really hard to honor your parents when all they do is nag you or if they don't ever spend any time with you. Our children should feel like they can come to us with difficult stuff. And that means as soon as we hear it, we don't just fly off the handle and say, whoa, why didn't I know about this before? Um, we ask them questions. That's a good way kind of a, as probing. Ask questions. Let them, let them give the, uh, the answer. Don't put words into their mouth. We should be in the relationship building business. Uh, in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14, it tells us not to be yoked with unbelievers. And we read that, and we quote that sometimes. But why is it that that was given? Paul's telling the Corinthian church because he thinks that it's important we know healthy or pardon me, healthy re relationships should be the number one thing. Healthy relationships. Um, the, uh, the story is told of two guys. One was a young staffer at this business, and the older was an, uh, a mid-level manager. And they had offices right across from each other. And one day, they happened to be in four straight meetings together. And the older manager would always leave the meetings looking for refreshed and alert. And, you know, he, the younger guy's always emotionally drained after every meeting. And so finally, he walks over to his office and he says, you know, I don't get it. How do you manage to go through these meetings listening for hours on end and you still look energetic? It just wipes me out. And the older guy said, well, who said I was listening? <laughs> He's just sitting there in the meetings. He's not paying attention. Well, that's not going to work in our homes. You can't get through life just on, you know, autoplay. Uh, there was a movie that came out a few years ago, and I, I don't recommend it, but it was called Click, and it was about a remote control. And uh, he's able, in one part of the thing, as the way the story goes, I think he had a fast-forward mode. And sometimes we go on autopilot in life, and we just kind of get through the day. And that's not healthy. It's not healthy for us. It's not healthy for anybody around us. Another one, and this is a biggie, a communication killer, is love. Now, that ought to be automatic, right? Why is it that God commands us to love our spouse? Why is it God commands us to love our children? Surely there's not moments where they seem unlovable, right? <laughs> Why does he say love one another? That, that, sh that should be natural for a Christian, right? We should naturally love each other. Why does he... That, do what? That is, it's the greatest command. But why does it have to be commanded? Well, shouldn't that be natural for a Christian? It should be. Yet, how many times does the Bible say that we're commanded to love? We're commanded to love. Love even our 
enemies. Now, you probably wouldn't think that this would be on a list of things that's a communication issue, but it certainly is. Let me share some heartbreaking stats with you. In 2005, the National Center for Health Statistics, and this is a, a group that, that pulls beyond the Christian borders, just to children in general and to families in general, 80% of the kids that they surveyed felt like they were unloved by their parents. 80%. And the reasons were bro broke down because they, they, they didn't have the parents' support at home. They came home to an empty house or they, mom and dad drop them off at daycare at 5 a.m. They go to school until 3. They go back to aftercare from 3 to 6. They go home, do homework, eat and go to bed, get up the next day and do the same thing. 80% of these kids said, I don't have a relationship with my parents. I feel like they don't love me at all. Uh, in 44 of the 50 states, there were 2,118,000 newly married couples. This, this just since May 12th when I took these statistics off this website. So this is just from January to May this year. So 2.2 million marriages. How many of those have went through divorce already? <laughs> So I'm glad it's not that much, but it, you would think it'd be high, 6.8%. So 6 point, almost 7% of all marriages that have happened just in this year have already ended in divorce. 8.1 million Americans are just living together, cohabitating. Somebody told me the other day, I said, you ought to be really excited. The, the, uh, the divorce rate has gone down. You know, in the 90s, it was 60%, and it slowly now has faded to about 53% of marriages end in divorce. And you know, we would go, oh, that's great. But there are more and more people that aren't even getting married in the first place. And that's, that's not helpful either. If we truly love one another, then we do what God has called us to do. And if we love God, we allow him to be a part of our relationship, which is, we'll talk about covenant building in a little bit. 44% of all children have a step sibling. And that means that either they're with one parent or both parents bringing another child into their life. 41% of all births are to unwed moms. And so we look at that and we say, well, those are some amazing statistics. That's huge numbers. So what does that tell us? It tells us that in our homes there's brokenness. My parents divorced. And some of you may have been through that before. Uh, and there are a lot of people in our world that need to be ministered to. All that brokenness, those are open doors of opportunity for the church, for us as Christians, to reach out to these individuals and to bring them in and to encourage them. Um, talking about divorce, and I, I mentioned this uh, to, to Slate, we were talking about it just the other day. There are 10 cities, the top 10 cities, this was this last year on Daily Beast, of divorce rates. Would you believe that there are four in Florida? Highest divorce rate in the country um, was Panama City. Florida. Uh, the number one state last year for divorce, state, not city, was Alabama. And that breaks my heart to see that's a lot of baggage for a child to have to carry when they've gone through those things. I have stepsisters. Um, some of you may as well, stepsisters, stepbrothers. And those are open doors for us to reach out to those people. If we really want to make a difference in our community, if we see a dynamic Let's say that you look out in Winter Haven here, and you see that there are maybe thousands of kids that are going through a life like that, where there's, there's divorce or cohabitation or something like that. What are we doing to meet the needs of those children? The parents also need encouragement as well, but what are we doing to meet their needs? Are we you know, bringing them in? Are we offering counseling? Maybe offering some before care, after care programs to bring those children in and have the teachers and the ministers in that environment, people who've gone through the same things, that can share and can talk, we need that. We need that in, in every city. We really do. And then one more is faith. Faith is a communication killer. I did a uh, lesson one time on religiously mixed marriages. We had probably a run of tapes on that one. We had a lot of people asking for those. Is what do you do when you have one person in the family that's of one religious belief and one that's of another. And some of you may be in that situation now or you've been through it before. How do you handle that when one person has one faith and one person has another? It can be a, a communication killer. It's a very difficult thing to overcome. We have to decide 
uh, where we're going to go to church. We have to decide how we're going to view the Bible. We decide how we're going to raise our children. Um, we had not long ago um, a couple we know that the, one of the parents was uh, from a, a denominational background where they sprinkled the child, and it was tearing the other one up. Just tearing them up. I don't want to do this. I don't want to allow this to take place. And so how do you handle those things? Well, we need to get on the same page with our faith. We need to grow in our faith together. Maybe we sit down and we pray together and ask God to lead us to the right place. Ask God to lead us to the right place to worship, to, to be around the right congregation that's for our children and for us. Um, we need to spend time talking to our children about our own faith. My grandfather used to talk about his faith all the time. Uh, and that helped me. And I'm sure that helped you too if you had relatives that were like that. We're, we're not ashamed to talk about why they came to Christ, what they've dealt with. Remember Timothy's story. Timothy had Eus, Eunice and Lois, his mother and grandmother. And Paul says, you know, I, I praise God for those ladies, those Christian sisters who were such an inspiration to you to help you build your faith. We bring them to church, but we also study and we pray with them. We develop their talents. Uh, we take care of ministry opportunities. And then we serve with our kids. When there are things that need to be done, we don't you know, just send the kids to do it. We go and, and we do it with them. Faith should not be a communication killer, but it is. So let's change that. Let's spend more quality time together talking about how we can build our faith together. Your spouse should be increasing your faith. Your children should be increasing your faith. And likewise, the other way around. Do what you can to build them up. So is there a bell? No bell. Okay. What time? Should be 15. 15 after. Okay, we've got about two minutes. Would you like to add to this list? What are some things you see that, that are communication killers in the home that we need to get out of the way? Yeah. Well, rather than talk about communication killers, it's no response. I would, um, Philippians, back to Philippians 4, 8. Yeah, second, absolutely. You know, when you talk about, or when you read that, and it says to focus on everything that's love and good report, mm -hmm. um, Eyes fixed on Jesus. Fixed on Jesus. That's right. Hebrews 3 1. Keep your yeah. thoughts fixed on Jesus. That's right. Jesus is all of those things. And that's what kill, helps the communication in your home. Mm -hmm. Focus on the good things. Not just think about the killer, but think about your ally, how he helps you stay strong. If we focus on what's positive, that's what's going to help our communication in our homes to stay peaceful, to stay focused on Jesus. Absolutely. He has to be the centerpiece. Uh, marriages are built on Christ. Churches are built on Christ. Families are built on Christ. Spiritual living is built on Christ. You see a pattern there? Everything. Christ is the foundation. What else? Other communication things? Killers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what we uh, probably need is to have a plan beforehand as opposed yeah. to trying to lean Right. Right. Well, before they start having children and what have you, and decide that this is a plan we want to go with. And that needs to be visited on a regular basis as opposed to just like, okay, didn't we have a plan? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like budget. You know, right. You have a budget, you need to stick with the budget, and, and if you, you need to review that budget every so often because of changes in what's going on. So right. And that gets into that covenant contract. And both, both the husband and the wife need to be committed to making those things happen. And that's why premarital counseling is so important before we get married. Uh, how many documents do you have to fill out now to buy a house? And that's not even the most important thing you'll engage in in your life. You know, your relationship to Christ, your relationship with your spouse is way more important. How many documents do you have to pour through, pour through to rent a car, you know, or buy a car? We have all this paperwork we have to go through. And there are so many scriptures that deal with all these stages of life. Even if you're going to work, you know, sometimes we'll just tell our kids, hey, you need a job, so-and-so's applying, so-and-so's applying. If we sat down with our children and said, we want you to be somewhere where you're going to be on track with people that you're going to work around, that are going to encourage your faith, that are going to get you on the right track, things that you're going to learn that are going to help you later on in the world, uh, we begin to focus on those kinds of things. Sometimes we just kind of jump into stuff. We just, we purchase things, or we go to work, or we, and we do the same thing sometimes in marriage. Well, I just love this person. Well, okay, uh, tell me what you love about them. Well, I just, I love spending time with them. Okay, well, what, give me, and they start going down features. That ought to be a red flag. They're beautiful. Hey, we all age. 
I don't think my wife realized how gray I was going to be by 40. You know, there's things that, t that change as we go along the way, and you have to be educated on that stuff before you just jump into a relationship. So, very good. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. True. It doesn't make them bad. That's right. It doesn't make that event bad. It's just not good for our family at right. this time. Right. And having a plan ahead of time, you know, understanding that there are going to be things that's going to go on even at church mm. that's not right for our family at this particular time. That's right. It doesn't make it bad. Right. 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 That's a great point. That's a great point. And Paul deals with that a little bit in Romans when he starts talking about, you know, there are certain feast days, you know, and if you, if you want to celebrate those feast days, you go right ahead. And if you don't, you don't. The problem is trying to push my personal feelings on somebody else and violating their conscience. But yeah, prepare people ahead of time. You prepare your kids. You know, we're going to go here. The kids are going to go downstairs and watch a movie that uh, probably is inappropriate. You're not going to go down there and watch that movie. You're, uh, Halloween's coming up. A lot of people are anti-Halloween. You know, they say, okay, well, this is, this is what's going to happen. Or, or sadly, even anti-Christmas. So you, you deal with those things before you get to that environment. You train them and you plan and you talk about it and you pray together before they have to encounter it. It's just good planning. It's great planning. All right. Well, I think our time is gone, so we're going to take a break here and then get ready for worship.